there's enough glory to go around. And I think the problem here is that Netanyahu just doesn't want to share the glory. He would get full credit, but uh, he didn't want to discuss it with his defense minister. Uh, I think that uh, in the short clip you showed from Barbara Opal, there's another example of the way in which Israel can approach this. The United States has, by law, a commitment to maintaining Israel's qualitative military edge. The sale of F-35s to its new uh, openly strategic partner in the Middle East, uh, the UAE, can be used by Israel to ensure that its qualitative military edge is maintained, not just by the ways that Barbara mentioned, but in terms of other arms sales that Israel might like to have now to that it currently doesn't have access to. So I think that, that this is, in a way, a storm in a teacup of the prime minister's own making. It's totally unnecessary. But... Israelis need to understand that, that this is the name of the game. Then there is no agreement between Israel and the UAE. It's an agreement between the United States and the UAE for the United States to sell F-35 uh, fighter aircraft uh, to the UAE. And I, I think that, that people should just get over it and recognise that this is part of the deal, part of the price of peace. Right, and there is always certain prices for peace. Now, as you said, this is an historic agreement that should be, certainly in Israel, should be celebrated and for its supporters. But I notice you did call this a uh, an accidental breakthrough on the part of President Trump's Mideast diplomacy. What do you mean by accidental breakthrough? Well, if you, if you look back uh, through the annals of American peacemaking diplomacy, uh, some of which I've been directly involved in, you see that when you push on one door, when the United States pushes on one door, often another one opens. In this case, Trump was pushing his peace plan, but as part of that plan, uh, in, in an ill-advised way, he green-lighted uh, Netanyahu's annexation of 30% of the West Bank, including all of the settlements and the Jordan Valley. And uh, that caused a huge ruckus created a real problem for the leader of the United Arab Emirates, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, because he wanted to normalise, and the backlash created by, by Netanyahu's intentions to annex territory was just creating, making it more difficult for him to move forward because of the backlash in the Arab world. And on top of that, he's very concerned about the stability of, of Jordan, his ward, as, uh, if you like, uh, King Abdullah of Jordan, uh, who would be deeply affected by annexation of the Jordan Valley. And he, he needed to find a way to put a stop to that. And to cut a long story short, uh, he came up with this idea, together with his ambassador in Washington, Yusuf al that instead of saying no uh, normalisation with the UAE, if you, Israel, go ahead with annexation, let's turn it on its head and say... If there's no annexation, we'll do full normalization. Right. And that way, put a stop to annexation and made normalization, which he had always wanted, possible. Uh, that was Trump's green lighting of annexation, was the thing that produced the full normalization. But it was an accident on right. Trump's part. He didn't intend it to be that way. But a breakthrough nonetheless, sort of breaking the paradigm that no Arab country would make full relations with Israel until a Palestinian peace deal. Let's take a listen, to, though, to the reaction that finally came out from the foreign ministry of Saudi Arabia to the agreement. So when we uh, sponsored in 2002 the Arab peace plan, we fully envisioned uh, that there would be uh, eventually uh, relations between all Arab states, including Saudi Arabia and Israel. Uh, but the conditions for that in our perspective, from our uh, point of view are quite clear that uh, uh, peace must be achieved between the Palestinians and Israelis based uh, on the internationally recognized uh, parameters. And one, you know, once that is achieved, uh, all things are possible. Martin, it certainly seems the Saudi foreign minister there is sticking to the, uh, as I said, the paradigm that a peace comes, will come, or normalization with Israel will come only after a peace agreement with the Palestinians. What do you think about other countries in the Gulf that we've been speculating, uh, Bahrain, Oman? Are they going to follow the Saudi model 
Or you think the UA model, UAE model? I think that. Well, we'll see. I do think that Bahrain and Oman were already moving even faster than than the UAE. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, I think, jumped ahead of them by this move. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if they do go ahead. They'll all look at, to see what the reaction is in the Arab world, in particular what the reaction is from the Palestinians, whether it, they need to be concerned about that. But I think that they probably will. Oman has a new leader, a new sultan. He may be taking his time. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Bahrain comes next. And I wouldn't write off Sudan yet, despite uh, the hiccup. Now, Saudi Arabia is a different story. And there's just one thing I'd, uh, point I'd like to make here. I think that Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, when he did this, didn't do it with the calculation that others would follow. He wanted the benefits of being the first mover. And uh, as far as I know, he didn't consult with any of his other uh, leaders in, the, in uh, the Gulf, including, as far as I know, I may not have full, the full picture, he didn't include with Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and so uh, he wasn't counting on Saudi Arabia following. He's not looking uh, for more company. He was courageous right. in this decision and, and acted on his own. Right. Saudis have their own calculations. Uh, I think uh, that the old guard uh, feels still some commitment to the Palestinians and, and is not ready to forsake them. Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, has made it clear much earlier that he thought... Uh, the Arab world should get over this, should move on with Israel, and Palestinians had had their chance. So I think if he had his druthers, he'd probably uh, go ahead now, and I wouldn't rule it out. But I think that he's got a problem with his father, who's still the king, and uh, they will want to see some movement, some progress on the Palestinian front, of which there's none. Well, let me ask you, Armand, we, about 30 seconds, uh, the Palestinians sticking to their playbook, should they change that and should perhaps try to at least open a dialogue either with Israel or the U.S. now? Yeah, I, th I think that the whole anti-normalization approach uh, was mistaken from the beginning. Uh, they succeeded in creating kind of glass ceiling uh, but now that's broken by what the UAE has done. And so, yes, they need to, I think, engage directly with Israel, including at the level of the people. Uh, the idea that you cut off contact between Israelis and Palestinians has been so counterproductive to the important effort to build trust between the people, rebuild trust that's been destroyed by the Intifada and the violence. And I think that, that uh, I wish that the Palestinians would recognize that, that they have an opportunity in this situation rather than just see it as a straight-out betrayal.